Hey there, Dearborn Christian Fellowship. Pastor Brad here. Hope you had a great weekend and are having a great start to another week as we seek to pursue Christ together throughout this week. I um, want to encourage you this morning with something to think about as you seek to pursue Christ this week. And that's the idea of helping others to pursue Christ throughout their week as well. And especially those who live and exist under our care. For those who are parents, who have young kids, for those who are grandparents, who are blessed enough to have their grandkids living around them, though with technology accessible, making interactions accessible, um, even distance isn't necessarily a reason not to do this uh, anymore. But my encouragement to you is this, be intentional to disciple the younger generation in your midst as parents. We are the primary disciplers of our kids, not the church. The parents have been told uh, in Deuteronomy 6, teach your children the ways of the Lord. As you rise in the morning, as you lay down at night, as you walk along the way, bind them on your foreheads, teach them as you go about the Lord. Um, one of the biggest struggles, I think, for kids as they grow up in the church is seeing a disconnect between what the family does on Sunday and what the family does the rest of the week. We talk about Jesus on Sunday. We sing songs to Jesus on Sunday. We don't talk about Jesus Monday through Saturday. It's just kind of this separate, set-apart category. Friends, may that not be true of your home. If it is true of your home, change it today. Um, set aside time as a family. Disciple your kids. Pray with them at night. Pray with them around the dinner table. Teach them. Invite them into that prayer. Um, disciple them, take them out to breakfast on occasion and, and do some devotional stuff with them. Help them to see you reading your own Bible. Show them that it's important to you. Um, but be conscious, be aware of, um, of raising up the next generation. They're always watching and it's our responsibility to teach them the truths of the faith that we hold to, that we long for, them to hold to as well. There's no greater joy than knowing that your children walk with the Lord. Um, and so that takes years, indeed decades, of seed planting um, that the Holy Spirit will use to birth faith in them. Of course, he's the one that does that work, but we're called to be faithful in planting and watering those seeds day after day, year after year, decade after decade. So consider doing that in your own lives, in your own homes, in your own worlds today and this week. All right, we're continuing on in the Apostles' Creed. We are on line five of the Apostles' Creed. Sorry, line five of section two um, that unpacks the work of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus the Christ, who is truly God, truly man, born of the Virgin Mary. Last week we saw suffered under Pontius Pilate, um, all that that testified to in his sinless life, being unjustly condemned to death by a civil magistrate in a public setting. Um, and so today we move on in that same 24-hour window. After he was condemned to die by Pontius Pilate, the Apostles' Creed then says he was crucified, he died, and was buried. We're going to go through those three things today. Next week, we'll dive into the he descended into hell line that gets people riled up and uh, don't they, they often don't like it if they thought about it a lot and with good reason. Well, there, yeah, it needs to be thought through well. It needs to be thought through well. Uh, but today, we avoid that. We just do the crucified died and was buried. Crucified. Why did Jesus have to die being crucified? Right? There's lots of ways to die. But for Jesus, he was crucified upon a cross, which was the way of executing publicly prisoners deserving of the worst sorts of death for the worst sorts of crimes. And, you know, it was the Roman execution method. So it was common in that day for people to die. Obviously, we know that two people were crucified next to Jesus, one on each side, one of whom will meet someday in paradise. We don't know. We don't have evidence that the other one came to saving faith on that cross. Um, but the one certainly did. And Jesus promised him, today you'll be with me in paradise. But why crucifixion? Well, 
turns out there's a good reason. It wasn't random. Okay, it's all part of the sovereign plan of God to save and redeem a broken world. We get the answer to that question in Galatians chapter 3. As Paul's writing this letter to the church in Galatia, that region of Lystra, Iconium, Derby, right? We saw that in Paul's first missionary journey, um, that, that Asia region. And so here's what Paul writes. And, and um, he's going to make the link of Jesus dying on the cross to satisfy a problem that was true for us because of our sin. Here we go. Verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Okay, right. So because we have not perfectly obeyed God's law, we are now under a curse from God. That curse is judgment. That curse is separation from God. That, that curse is wrath. That curse is eternity in hell. That is the curse of God because we do not obey everything, abide by all the things written in the book of the law, God's law. Even just summarize it to the Ten Commandments. Haven't done it. Haven't done it. Therefore, we're cursed. Verse 11, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, right? You cannot be justified by obeying the law because you've already broken it and will continue to break it. You don't do all of the things, all of them. For it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So now righteousness is obtained no longer by perfect obedience, but by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. So you have to do all of the law to be able to live by the law. And that's not true of a single person other than Jesus, right? But for every human being, we are under a curse. Okay. So what do we need? We need redemption. We need to be brought out from under that curse. And so Paul writes in verse 13, Christ be redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Well, how did he become a curse for us? Well, the Old Testament says in Deuteronomy 21, 23, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. God knew that we need to be redeemed from being under the curse. And so Christ redeemed us by becoming a curse for us. He took on the curse of God by dying on a cross. Crucifixion was the method by which uh, it was seen and understood as having been cursed by God. And so it was no accident. It was no random coincidence. The decisions made by those Romans was fulfilling the, the very work of God. That Christ became what we needed. Christ took on what was ours. The curse that we had because of our sin by not obeying the full law of God, Christ took on, though he had fully obeyed the law. He was a perfect law um, adherent. He lived by them because he obeyed them perfectly. Yet, he goes to a cross, crucified, becomes a curse for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Verse 4 just wraps it up. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, covenant theology, might come to the Gentiles. What is the blessing of Abraham? Receiving the promised spirit through faith. Abraham believed God, had faith in God's promise, was counted righteous. We are counted righteous by faith in what Christ has done by dying on a cross, by being crucified, by becoming a curse for us. And we receive that same spirit, the Holy Spirit, now dwelling within us. So, he was crucified. But he also died. Okay, now, it's kind of two ways of saying the same thing. One is the method of death. One is the, the method of dying. One is just kind of stating, he died. Death happened. End of life. Why? Why does that matter? Well, because, as I was explaining to... Uh, Caleb and Aaron and Jonas Engler this morning when we were 
going through the Heidelberg Catechism before school, death uh, equals justice. God is a God of justice, right? God is just. Therefore, the scales are always in balance with God. Well, our sin against God, our rebelling against God, they brought the scales out of balance, right? Just like any offense has a sentence brought to it so that in paying that offense, the scales are brought back into justice. The only thing that could bring the scales of justice back into balance with God from the human sin standpoint is death. The wages of sin is death. God told Adam and Eve, if you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. Death is the result of sin. Death is the only punishment that brings the scales of justice back into balance. And so Jesus had to die. He died, and he did die. And he did die so that God might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in him. All will have death count for their sin. The question is, will your spiritual death and separation count for your sin as it should? Or will you have received the mercy of God so that Jesus' death counts for your sin against God? All people will have their debt paid in the end by death. The question is, will it be paid by the one who has actually sinned or by the one who knew no sin but became sin so that he might pay the price for your sin? Jesus died on that cross to bring the scales of God's justice back in to balance. And he was then buried in to Joseph's tomb because this wasn't some thing on the cross where, you know, he pretended to die, but he didn't actually die. No, there is very physical evidence that testifies to the fact that Jesus was dead. And that evidence is that he was buried in the tomb. They put a spear in his side, right? He was taken down off of that cross, his body limp, and he was laid into a tomb. And when that when that tomb was shut with that stone, that was it. They thought, they thought it's done. It's over and done. There was finality to it, at least in terms of what the human perspective on it was. There was finality because Jesus died and he was buried and all could see it. It was a public testimony to the fact that this death was final. Um, of course, we know it wasn't final, but in those moments, it was thought to be final. And so it was important that he was taken off of that cross rather than thinking he was dead, thinking, you know, finding out he was just unconscious, but then you take him down and he's, he revives, he's alive again. You give him some wine, you give him the smelling salts and boom, back to life. Nope, dead, buried, over, done. Until it wasn't, but uh, he was truly dead. The other piece about death in that, that I just want to say is, um, you know, the death of Christ also gives us a picture of what our life is now to be about, right? We were buried with him in baptism, Paul says. And so the intent of that is for us to see that our old self, who we used to be before Christ, is now in the process of dying continually. We are continually dying to our old way of life. We are to put to death the old ways, our old self, the things that we used to to love, used to hope for, used to revel in when we were not walking according to the Spirit. Now that we're walking according to the Spirit, we're to put those things to death. Um, and so that death, we'll still die physically, and that'll actually be a blessing because we want to be delivered from this body of death, and in the new heavens and new earth, we'll receive resurrected bodies that will no longer be tainted by sin. But spiritually, um, Jesus paid that price of death for us. Yet in this body, we are to continually die to ourselves and put to death the old way of life. Okay, have a great week, loving and serving your king, and I'll see you on Sunday.